Hello, and welcome to CII's webinar, CII Practices to Help Restart Projects. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. This webinar focuses on restarting projects that have been suspended or significantly slowed down due to COVID-19 and their reactions to it. This is a topic that you asked for, and we want you to know that we're listening to you. Some general information. This webinar is being recorded, so we'll keep everybody on mute. The material will be available on our blog page, which you see on the screen. On your control panel, you'll see a section called Questions. Please feel free to enter your questions there, and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. Also on your control panel, there is a section called Handouts. In there, you'll find a PDF of these slides and a Word document with information about how to find the practices I'm going to discuss in our knowledge base. One caveat for this presentation, we assume projects to be restarted are in the execution phase. Projects in the front-end planning phase that have been stopped or slowed will still follow CII's front-end planning process. I'm Mike Pappas, CII's Associate Director for Deployment, and I've been on staff at CII for three years. I'm a civil engineer by education and a project manager by experience. I managed projects for 10 years, first for the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps in the North Carolina, Japan, and the Caribbean, and then for the Farnsworth Group in central Illinois. Then I was a self-employed consultant for 15 years, and much of that work focused on professional development training and working with project teams to customize and implement CII practices. I took some inspiration from my favorite Texas Monthly issue every year, The Best Barbecue Joints. Now, you don't read this kind of article and expect it to perfectly match your list. You read it to find out about some places you don't know about and that you might like to try. I suggest you take the same approach to this webinar. This is my list. I'm sure some of the practices will be familiar to you, but some may not be. I challenge you to see if some of these fit your project situation and you might want to try them. Here's the list. You might say, he's going to go over all that in an hour? Well, one, it's an overview, and two, I'm going to go fairly quickly. So yes, I'm going to cover all these in an hour. The first six deal with risk management and various types of assessment checklists. The next two deal with team dynamics and specifically if we are managing the project in a way to achieve our stated priorities. The next two deal with our craft professionals, one dealing with safety and one dealing with labor productivity. The last two deal with commissioning and startup phase of the project. Now, please don't think that you have to use all of these on your project in order to restart it. Each project situation demands different actions, so necessarily the appropriate tools will be different for different situations. You can access all of these from our knowledge base, which you can reach from our website homepage. As I mentioned before, in your control panel under Handouts, you can download a Word document that has details on that. Okay, here we go. The first practice is CII's risk management process. This is a process summary document that was developed for use if you need to create or improve the effectiveness of your risk management process. Risk management is one of those processes that is never complete on a project. The practice lays out the steps of a risk management process and summarizes CII research on risk through its publication date. If you don't have a solid risk management project on your or process on your project, you're essentially flying blind and you can only react to what happens to you. There's no way you can proactively manage your project. Here are some keys to a good risk management process. First, it includes many perspectives. This is not the kind of thing where you want three people to sit down and create your risk register unless you have a small and very straightforward project. A good risk management process is evidenced by the project team updating risks and risk management plans on a regular basis. The risk management landscape, as I call it, always changes. Now, we have new risks due to COVID-19 and the reactions to COVID-19. Governors in various states have said that construction can continue or construction must stop, or some types of construction can continue and other types must stop. These kinds of government actions are events that may or may not happen in the future, so they are risks. When will they be changed? 
that's uncertain. Um, once construction is open, will it be closed again by government action? That's uncertain. Will there be a second wave of, of the virus that impacts your project? That's a new risk. There are other things like the social distancing requirements that are no longer risks. They are issues that we have to deal with. So things like additional lunch and break facilities, taking lunch and breaks and shifts, additional buses to bring people to site, all of those things that we have to do in order to maintain social distancing are no longer risks. So the risk landscape changes constantly, and it's our job as project managers to stay on top of that. Third, each risk has an owner and a deadline assigned to it. Fourth, the team considers both preventive actions, those that can prevent the risk event from occurring, and recovery actions. If the risk event does occur, what can we do to limit the damage to the project objectives? And last, a good risk management process is linked to the schedule, cost, and contingency estimating process. Our second tool today is the Integrated Project Risk Assessment, or IPRA. This is a risk identification and assessment checklist that can improve the effectiveness of your risk management process. Using a checklist is generally a good idea to help you not miss something, but you don't want to use it as a crutch and assume it covers everything, so be sure to think outside the checklist as well. Now, you want to use this with a neutral facilitator and the project team. A neutral facilitator doesn't necessarily mean an independent third-party consultant, although it can be, and people obviously offer that service. It can be somebody in your company. It just needs to be someone who is not connected to the project at all. That neutrality is important to keep intentional and unintentional biases out of the process. We need to have someone who can challenge the project team appropriately and make sure we're getting a realistic result, because all of these tools are only as good as the input. We all know the saying, garbage in, garbage out. And it's easy for us as engineers to reverse engineer things and figure out what the answers need to be in order to get a good final score. But that defeats the whole purpose of the tool. The checklist includes 82 risk factors grouped into 14 categories. When they develop this tool, they consider different perspectives, that of the investors, asset owners, EPC contractors, and asset operators. So they followed the guidance of good risk processes by getting input from different perspectives. It includes a formal method to identify and assess risk, and this is one of those tools that you want to use repeatedly throughout the project life cycle, because as we discussed, the risk landscape constantly changes. In the far left column, you see seven of the 82 risk elements that make up the business plan category. For each risk, you first estimate the likelihood of that risk occurring. In the IPRA, this is ranked from one to five, from very low to very high. There is a not applicable category, but that is only if the risk truly does not exist on your project. Not if you don't think it will bite you, or you think you have it covered, or if you write it down, it'll get unwanted attention from the home office. The next step is to estimate the relative imp impact of the risk if it occurs. In the IPRA, this is ranked on an A through E scale from negligible to extreme. And again, you see the descriptions down at the bottom. One of the unique things about the IPRA is that it was originally developed for projects in new and complex jurisdictions. Sometimes you're in a new situation and early in front end planning, you don't even know completely what you're getting into or how to assess the impact of a risk, the unknown unknowns, if you will. Well, the IPRA has this baseline column that you can use as a starting point for severity if you have nothing else to go on. Now, if you do this, stick with the baseline impact until you have enough information that you can make your own rating, but at least it's a good place to start. When your project is in execution, though, you should no longer be relying on those baseline recommendations. All of your impact ratings should be based on your knowledge of the project and the situation. There are 12 extreme risks in the IPRA. If you've ever had issues with any of these, you know how serious they are. These are the kind of things that can cripple a project. Let's talk about the process. The tool includes a detailed description for each of the 82 elements. 
So you read the description, you discuss that risk in the workshop, then you discuss what the likelihood of occurrence and relative impact for that risk are, as I just showed you. And then you plot the risk on the risk matrix. At the end of the assessment, you can see how the risks are distributed to get an overall view of your risk picture. Our third practice is the Project Definition Rating Index, or PDRI. This is designed to determine how much is enough in front-end planning. Again, you want a neutral facilitator and appropriate representation from the project team in this exercise. Now, some of you are saying, hold on, Mike, you said earlier you assume projects to be restarted or in the execution phase. Why are we talking about a front-end planning tool? If you're in a situation where you're early in execution, still in engineering, and it's clear that the, um, it's, sorry, it's clear to you that the front-end planning was not done thoroughly, it might be worth a couple hours to evaluate the project with the PDRI to see what is being carried over from front-end planning that you now have to complete in execution. Remember that because you're in execution, you should be under the target score of 200, and ideally even close to the minimum possible score. The PDRI is our most popular tool, and we have a number of versions of it. The original one was for industrial projects, and then we developed one for building projects and one for infrastructure projects. Then we developed versions for small industrial and small infrastructure projects. And most recently, we developed one for manufacturing and life sciences projects, which is a hybrid of the industrial and building versions. I won't go into detail on this tool today because it's primarily a front-end development tool. But as I said, it can be useful in some unique situations during early execution. Number four is the Project Health Indicator. This was designed as a complement to the PDRI. Use the PDRI during front-end planning and use the Project Health Indicator during execution. Again, use it with a neutral facilitator and representatives of the project team. This is intended to fill the gap between indicators that are quantifiable by project controls and those that are a little more subjective. The research team started with about 180 leading indicators, and they statistically reduced that to the most important 43 that are not included in the PDRI. The score represents the risk of not achieving your desired outcomes. These are the first seven leading indicators as an example of what is in the tool. This is a shot of the input screen. For each leading indicator, the team answers the degree of problems it has with that statement, from serious problems to minor problems or no problems. You can do this for all 43 leading indicators. This is the first of two output dashboards. This shows your likelihood of achieving successful outcomes overall and in the areas of cost, schedule, quality, safety, and satisfaction. The second dashboard shows your performance on each of eight project management practices. Based on the research, the gauges are read from zero to 700 points yellow to 850 points, and green to 1,000 points. But these are customizable based upon different project objectives, priorities, risk tolerance, and other project-specific factors. Our fifth tool is the Construction Readiness Assessment Tool. This is probably the first one that came to mind when thinking of what CII has that could help project restarts. It is designed to assess a project's readiness to start construction in order to prevent incomplete or out of sequence work. This research built upon a number of earlier research projects dealing with productivity, preventing premature starts, and the impacts of out of sequence construction. Too many projects start construction essentially because the schedule says to mobilize without taking the time to make sure that enough engineering and materials and installed equipment are available to stay ahead of the construction crews working in a proper sequence. This leads to out of sequence work, quality problems, poor morale, additional safety risks, delay claims, 
and all kinds of unsavory outcomes. The research team quantified the difference in performance between projects that started when ready versus projects that started too early, and these are the results. Personally, I like to turn this around. Starting construction too early is preventable, and we should always make sure we're ready before starting construction. So if we go ahead and start too early anyway, the expected risk is 25% more cost, 40% worse productivity, 7% more rework, 26% more change, and taking 28% longer. Now, I don't care how big of a hurry we think we're in, I'm not sure anybody would knowingly take on that kind of risk. If you're pressured to start construction too early, share these results with the decision maker. The longer duration alone negates the entire premise of starting early because we're in a hurry. Here is the process. The construction team answers 228 questions in the workshop and assigns corrective actions for those items that need them. As those issues are addressed, the project aligns with best practices to start construction when ready and prevent the kind of performance problems we discussed on the previous slide. This slide shows how the factors are grouped into 15 categories that affect a project's readiness to start construction. I'll give you a few seconds to look at this. This is the output of the gauge showing the readiness score. Of course, this is the overall indication. The real value is in the details behind the score, which are also part of the output report. This tool is designed to be used beginning in the def definition or feed phase of front-end development as a checklist. The score becomes more meaningful as you move through detailed design and engineering and get ready to start construction. We will be hosting a 60-minute webinar specifically for the construction readiness tool next week, including some ways to tweak it in light of the current COVID-19 situation. So if you'd like to learn more about this tool, please join us next Tuesday, May 19th, from 1 to 2 p.m. Central Time. The Word handout has a link to our upcoming webinars, and you can register there. Practice number six includes two checklists to assess the line design deliverables that tend to have quality problems. This is relatively new research. I think this came out, I think it came out three years ago. And the original research looked at troubling deliverables for industrial projects. The response was so good that we did a second research project to do the same thing for building projects. Both of these are listed in the Word document handout and we'll talk about the industrial version here. Many of us have seen drawings that look like this, although hopefully not this bad. The drawing says issued for construction, but there's so many holds on it that it looks like a thunderstorm. Somebody apparently built one of these one time, and this was the result. But seriously, incomplete or late engineering is a significant readiness for construction issue, and the construction readiness tool includes an entire section on engineering. So what do you do when you know this is an issue for your project and you need to take a deeper dive into the status and quality of your engineering? Here's the information about the research team. The team used this graphic to summarize the essentials of design quality, complete, correct, and timely. In terms of correctness, they asked owners and contractors, what is the frequency with which you see errors on more than 50 types of design deliverables? The pink area of the graph shows the deliverables that both owners and contractors said were incorrect, sometimes or more frequently. And that includes 11 of the deliverables. You see them listed on the right side of the slide. These are the troublesome deliverables, and so it makes sense to focus your quality control and quality assurance efforts here. So the research team built two tools to help assess quality for these 11. The first tool is the Design Deliverable Quality Assessment Tool. You select one or more of the 11 deliverables and where you are in the detailed design process. 
So in the example, you can see we've selected PNIDs and miscellaneous pipe support drawings at the 60% review stage. Once you've done this, the next screen shows the leading indicator metrics that are applicable for those deliverables at that stage. The team answers these yes or no questions, and then the output is a color-coded design quality index score for each deliverable from zero to one. You see both of those deliverables, PNIDs has a 0 0.33, miscellaneous pipe support drawings has a 1.0. That indicates its correctness, as you see there in the slide. The next output page lists all of the leading indicator metrics that were answered no, so you have an itemized checklist to work from. So when we look at the other two dimensions of quality, we have the baseline, sorry, we have the completeness of design deliverable checklist tool. Here you select the deliverables you're interested in. We've selected the level three baseline schedule, constructability inputs, and the 3D model and clash detection. The second set of input screens shows the completion elements for each of the selected deliverables. Here we're looking at elements for the level three baseline schedule. The team answers these yes or no questions and the output, again, includes the color-coded completeness scores from zero to one, just like the previous tool, and the list of incomplete items that is shown here. Practice number seven is the alignment thermometer. Now, this is not new research, but it is still very relevant in terms of team dynamics of how the project is managing 10 key issues and the alignment of the team as to how they view those 10 key issues. This is CII's official illustration and definition of alignment. Basically, are the team members working toward the same set of project objectives? Now, being former military, this illustration looks a little bit like a military parade. Everything's in perfect alignment. But you see some wiggle room in the definition. In the real world, alignment doesn't have to be perfect, but all the parts of the team do need to be moving in the same general direction or you're going to have problems. Yogi Berra had some great sayings, and this is my favorite when it comes to objectives, goals, and priorities. The research team started with more than 70 issues and statistically tested them and identified the most critical 10 that were included in the tool. When you use this tool, I like to say you're looking for smoke before the fire gets out of hand. And like all diagnostic tools, it only shows you the issues. You have to take appropriate action in order to correct anything that needs attention. These things never solve themselves. This is what the tool originally looked like. Of course, these days it's easy to put these questions in an online survey tool, which allows you to get input from more, from more people and also automates the results. I always recommend that you collect this data anonymously but I tend to add which part of the team the person is on. The owner's project management team, the owner's operations team, the design team, the construction team, et cetera, because it's not unusual for one part of the team to see these issues differently from another. For instance, people's on the, people on the owner's project management team might think that communication is open and effective, but the designer might not think so. Um, those differences can help you drill down a little bit to see where the real issue is. The first step is for each individual to select on a scale of one to five how well he or she agrees with each statement. For example, statement number one, stakeholders are appropriately represented on the project team. In this example, I agree with the statement as a four out of five. So you go through each statement like that. The second step is to carry the points over and add them up. So in this example, my score was 67 points out of 100, which indicates my level of agreement with those 10 statements. Step three is to look at the entire project team. In this case, columns one through seven indicate the seven people who filled out the survey. Now the average for issue number one is 8.3 out of 10. The average is how well we're doing managing that issue, so ideally we want to see high averages. In this case, 8.3 is good. We're happy with that. 
the range for issue number one is two out of 10. Of course, the range is the difference between the high and low scores, and this represents alignment. How similarly do the project team members view this issue? So ideally, we want to see low ranges. Two is good, we're happy with that. The range over average figure is a combined view of both of these aspects. Ideally, we want these to be low. 0 0.24 is good. Now, if we scan down the list of range over average, this score stands out as being high. The average is only 4.9 out of 10, so we're managing the issue poorly. The range is eight, so the team members view this issue very differently. There's no alignment on issue number eight. Step four is these radar plots for those who like visual output better than numbers. In this case, you want the gray plot to be small. One thing people get confused about is that the scales are reversed on these charts. Remember, we want high averages, so 10 is the bullseye on that chart, and we want low ranges, so zero is the bullseye on that chart. When we look at the average chart, these two issues, number eight and number three, jump out as areas where we're not doing so well. So we absolutely want to look into those. When we look at the range chart, issue number eight jumps out as having a lot of disagreement about how we're doing. So we want to look into that one as well for that aspect of it. In this example, the overall average score was 71. And the thermometer says we're in the green area on the comfortable road to success, right? Well, it does, but I wouldn't trust that in this case. It illustrates the danger of simply taking final score and running with it without understanding the components of how did I get to the final score. Remember the two issues that stood out on the average chart? We're not doing a good job managing number eight. Reward and recognition systems promote meeting project objectives. So we're probably going to have some motivation and teamwork problems as a result of that. And we're not doing a good job managing number three. The priority between cost, schedule, and required project quality features is clear. So we're back to Yogi Berra's quote about not knowing where we're headed. These two issues will create serious problems if they're not addressed. In order to maximize the tool's effectiveness, feel free to add project-specific questions. This is a great way to measure behavioral or soft skill types of team issues within the project team. Poll team members monthly or quarterly and report the results at your project meetings to let everybody know how you're doing in these areas. This will help you proactively find issues while they're small and easier to address. Practice number eight is the project priority calculator. And this is a little bit of a tough one because it assesses how well the owner's behavior matches the owner's stated priorities. The research looked at how these four inputs in the blue ovals drive safety, duration, cost, quality, and business outcomes. Step one is to prioritize the success criteria for the project and enter them here. This is obviously done during early front-end planning. Step two, and this is the part that is done, can be done repeatedly throughout the project, is to answer 62 questions spread out across the six tabs at the top, duration, cost, business, quality, safety, and project success. Here I'm showing you the safety tabs so you can get an idea of some of the questions that are asked. Some questions are repeated on various tabs. The questions are answered on a scale of one to five based on how the team agrees with that statement. The output screen shows you the original priorities you entered in step one compared to the current priorities based on the behavior of the owner from the answers to the 62 questions in step two. So in this case, we're not managing the project in a way that is going to achieve what we said were the priorities. We need to change our behavior in order to do that. You can see that this can be a little bit of a head slap in cases where the results look like this example and our behavior is so different than our original priorities. Now we shift to our craft professionals. And sticking with the idea of priorities, 
Let's talk about safety. This tool combines a, a training strategy, a planning strategy, and a worksite strategy in a comprehensive program to improve hazard recognition. These three strategies improved hazard recognition by at least 28% in the people who participated. We have three acronyms here. SAVES is the System for Augmented Virtuality Safety, a realistic augmented reality training environment that immerses workers in a job site simulation. SMQM is the Pre-Job Safety Meeting Quality Measurement, a maturity model that facilitates continuous improvement of the pre-job hazard identification and communication process, or toolbox talks. And HIT is a hazard identification and transmission board that records hazards at the work site to visually remind people what they're working with. Recognizing hazards is the foundation to working safely. I chose this safety practice because we have a lot going on right now. When we bring workers back to the job site, they're bringing a lot of emotions and stress with them. Some of them may have, have financial stress because they've been laid off for a while. A spouse or other family members might still be laid off. They may have concerns about family members' health or homeschooling or childcare not being available. We all know distraction is deadly on a construction site and there are a lot of potential distractions in this COVID-19 environment. We have to make sure our people have our heads in the game and that they're focused on the tasks and the hazards around them. This is the hit board, a visual reminder at the work site of the task hazards and new hazards that the crew is dealing with. I added the COVID-19 virus because for a while, we might need to add that to the new hazards section to remind us of social distancing and other mitigation actions that we need to take. Number 10 is the Best Productivity Practices Implementation Index, or the BIPI for short. This is designed to help project leaders plan to maximize productivity on the job site. So this is a good one if you're specifically concerned with labor productivity. The Construction Productivity Handbook is a comprehensive look at the factors that impact labor productivity. And there are two versions of the BIPI, one for industrial work and one for infrastructure work. The industrial version has 53 management practices across the six categories that you see here. The infrastructure version has 61 practices, or 60, yeah, the infrastructure version has 61 practices also across six categories. They're built similarly. This is what the research team found in terms of the difference in productivity factor between projects that had low scores and projects that had high scores. Greater than one is better, so you're looking at a 20% difference in productivity. And when that kind of improvement's on the table, you have my attention. This chart looks similar for the infrastructure version. This is just one of the six sections. And what you do here, of course, each one of these elements has a description for it and you read that and discuss it, and then rate the level of planning and implementation for that element on a one to five scale. And the output will give you the score for that section. This is a look at the first couple pages of the output report. You see the overall score of 43.7 in the bottom list, bottom left, not that great. On the top right, you see the overall score compared to the maximum possible score. And in the bottom right, you see the project score for each section in blue compared to the maximum possible score for that section in red. So in this example, there's plenty of room for improvement. Advanced work packaging is a hot topic right now. It's not a tool, it's an execution strategy. And some people ask if they should implement AWP on a project that has been shut down during execution. The answer is no. AWP really needs to be started during front-end planning in order to be effective. So please don't try to start it in the middle of execution. But workforce planning, workface planning, is the foundation for AWP. And that is definitely worth starting. Every time I've done productivity troubleshooting as a consultant, good workface planning addressed the issues. 
in a nutshell, work-phase planning is making sure the crews have everything they need in order to do their work before you assign them that work. The BIPI includes a section on work-phase planning. The process starts with the project plan, and you pull the next few weeks out of it as a short interval schedule. Then people in the workforce planning group confirm that the tools, information, materials, equipment, and other requirements are available. When all of the constraints have been eliminated, then the crew is assigned that work package. Now they can work productively and complete the work package rather than spend time hunting materials or consumables or being able to only do part of the work that somebody is going to have to come back later to complete. Planning for startup is number 11, and it's a planning model. It used to be that when you started thinking about startup about halfway through construction, but about 25 years ago, asset owners and operators started to say to the owner's project manager, hey, you're not going anywhere until the plant is not only mechanical complete, but it's also started up and operating like it's supposed to. Then you can get off the hook. Startup is the most sensitive time for project economics if you're the owner, which is the reason for this shift in attention. You've spent all the money on construction, and you're anxiously waiting for that first dollar of revenue. This is a time when cost overruns, but especially delays, can dramatically impact project economics. The top chart represents the NPV annual cash flow of the project as it was approved by the owner at final investment decision a smooth startup at the end of construction. The bottom chart has the exact same revenue profile, but after an 18-month delay during startup, which IPA tells us happens all too frequently in the oil, gas, and chemical industries. You can see the difference highlighted there. The impact of that 18-month delay was that the internal rate of, the, rate of return for the project was 30% less, and the payback period was extended by 60%. And that is a completely different risk profile than what the business made the decision based on. This could be one of those projects that the business said, if we knew how it would turn out, we would never would have approved it in the first place. Such a critical phase of the project demands careful planning. So the super tool was the answer to this need. It spells out 45 activities supported by 26 tools that are required to effectively plan for startup. The team rates itself on these activities and adds up the score. This is a very helpful chart that shows what your target super tool score should be across the various phases of the project. And the big takeaways here are that you should earn 48% of the points by the end of front end planning and your project sanction milestone and 85% of the points by the end of detail design and engineering. So if you're in execution and you're planning for startup isn't fairly mature, you're already behind on this critical element of success. The last practice today is achieving success in commissioning and startup, which is related to the planning for startup model. This tool identified 16 critical success factors and 45 indicators of whether or not those critical success factors have been achieved. Here you see a poster that the team developed, and you see the 16 critical success factors and the indicators on the left side of the poster. On the upper right side, you see the 16 CSFs placed on a project timeline. And like the planning for startup model, these are significantly front-loaded. By the end of detailed design, where you see the dashed line, 13 of the 16 CSFs should have been started, and nine of the 16 should have already been achieved. Now this team did a great job connecting this practice to the planning for startup process. Here you see that process and the team mapped the 16 critical success factors, which you see in the red circles, to that process. So the two practices work extremely well together. Okay, so what are the next steps? Well, I'd like you to enter your questions for me as I review this slide and then we'll get to the questions. First, remember our webinar next Tuesday, May 19th, from 1 to 2 p.m. Central Time, specifically on the Construction Readiness Assessment Tool. Learn more about these practices in our knowledge base. 
and I challenge you to choose a practice that sounds like it meets the needs of your project and try it. If you have questions, our contact information will be on the last slide. And last, when you leave the webinar in a few minutes, please answer the survey questions for us to help us know what else you would like to see in our webinars. Okay, let's see what kind of questions we have. Why is it called baseline in the IPRA risk assessment sheet? Good question. The baseline is the starting point, so the baseline for each of those risks is what you assess the risk or the impact, sorry, it's what you assess the impact of that risk to be if it happens. Sometimes early in a project, we don't know what we don't know. So that column is provided in case you need to guess at what the impact could be. And remember, if you need to, I mean, use it that way if you need to, but only until you have enough information to do your own assessment. If your project is in execution, everything should have already been assessed before the end of front end planning, and you shouldn't be relying on that baseline column anymore. Some of the impact ratings might be the same. I mean, the baseline might say D, and you've looked at the situation and you think it's a D, and that's fine. Um, you know, the, the rating might be the same, but that's because you've assessed the risk for yourself. Mark Munyon asks, you say the PHI, the project health indicator, is used during execution. Would you also use it in the front end loading process to predict the project's success? Uh, I would tend to say no, because it was designed to be used during execution. The biggest indicators of success in the front end are in the risk management process and the PDRI. In other words, if you have a realistic view of your risk landscape, and you're doing the right amount of work in the front end and the right work in the front end, then you're setting yourself up for success and execution, which is where the project health indicator is applicable. Okay. Uh, why isn't risk management one of the areas considered on the project? Well, it should be, it's very important. Um, Srini Vasan, I'm not sure which tool you're looking at here, but I would say that none of these tools are 100% comprehensive. So if you're using a tool that doesn't mention risk management, it doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that the research team was focused on other aspects of managing the project. So you're thinking the right way. Risk management is always important. Luigi asks, how does it link to AWP, especially engineering readiness and completeness? Well, we didn't talk about AWP today, mostly because you have to start that in front end planning in order for it to be effective. But when you have a project that's using AWP, yeah, engineering readiness is absolutely important. That's the whole purpose of AWP is to have engineering and procurement provide their work in the sequence that allows for the most efficient construction, the path of construction, we call it. Again, work phase planning is the installation work package part of AWP. And these have shown that you get better productivity, cost and schedule savings because of that. But you also get better quality and safety and less rework because the work is complete the first time you give the work package to the crew and you don't have to come back and chase a bunch of loose ends. Uh, Tim says, I have experienced using PDRI Matters, which is a useful enhancement of PDRI and includes elements of the alignment thermometer. What is your view of the combination of tools? Yeah, that's great. Now, the PDRI matters uh, is the latest version of the industrial PDRI. Matters is an acronym, M-A-T-R-S. It stands for Maturity and Accuracy Total Rating System. The original PDRI focused on the maturity of the deliverables. The A adds another dimension in this version to look at the accuracy of those deliverables. So that certainly is a welcome upgrade. It adds a lot of value to the use of the PDRI. Personally, I would continue to use the alignment thermometer theory throughout execution to check my team's alignment on those 10 questions that came from the research, plus any project-specific behavioral questions. As I mentioned, every month or at least every quarter to report out with the quote-unquote hard numbers from project controls, here's the way the team is behaving, is, is treating each other because we all know that the project is only as good as the team. If you have a good team that is committed, aligned, and working together, you can do incredible things. 
And so finding those problems while they're still small and addressing them while they're still small is very important. Okay, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time and we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Don't forget to register for next Tuesday's webinar on the Construction Readiness Assessment Tool. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.